of Romans chapter 5. Uh, we will be doing the 9 o'clock uh, again, like a little continental breakfast again. Uh, went well this time, so we'll see how it goes, and we'll play it by ear. And um, we're thinking about maybe doing something really special in August, the Sunday before school starts. We've been talking about that, so we'll see something with that. We'll let that you know that as we get closer to that as well. Romans chapter 5. We're going to do just uh, verses 3, 4, and 5 this evening. Romans 5, 3, 4, and 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope make not ashamed, because the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So let's pray as we open his word tonight. Father, we pray that you just would lead and direct your word of God tonight. Thank you for this simple truth that is yet profound and very beneficial to our lives, Lord, as we all face tribulation and stress times. But uh, just help us understand the truth within it, and may the Holy Spirit help us to live out this truth every day. We pray in your name. Amen. Many, many years ago, I, I guess back in the 70s, 80s, waterbeds. Remember waterbeds? All the rage. I don't know what happened to them. They don't, I don't hear anything about waterbeds anymore. I, I guess they've gone by their wayside. But back then, I remember, you know, if you were anybody in the, in the groove, you had to have a waterbed. Um, we never did. I don't think we could afford one. Um, but there was a couple I read that uh, got a waterbed. They put it all together. And then they realized they needed a hose to fill it. And they didn't have a hose. They lived in an apartment. So they went to the hardware store, bought a hose, came out, they hooked it to the faucet, put it up in the bed. And then they left to go somewhere because they figured it would fill up eventually. When they came back to check on it, they discovered that the husband bought a, uh, a sprinkler hose. You know what a sprinkler hose is, right? It's one of those hoses that have little holes all through it, so it sprays constantly. So... Something got more wet than just a waterbed, evidently. Now, that's a, a stressful, difficult tribulation moment that's actually self-inflicted. Uh, there are times in our life when we do self-inflict ourselves. Um, but there are other times in our life that we're, we're doing everything we're supposed to do and doesn't make any difference. Stress comes into life. Affliction comes into life. Um, it happens. And that's what Paul's talking about. And he talks about tribulations. That's the word he mentioned in verse 3. That particular word speaks about pressures. It, it kind of describes the idea that you're going through some narrow space and you have this sense that everything's collapsing on you. Um, you know, there have been times in my life where I have uh, gone into an apartment room or, or some, some building and the ceiling is like six foot five or six six. And I feel extremely uncomfortable because it's, it's right there ahead of me. And uh, our first apartment we lived in, we were in the second floor of a Cape Cod. And the ceilings were, I don't know, six, seven, maybe six, eight, I don't know. The bathroom door was like six foot. And I hit my head on it, I don't know how many times going into the bathroom. Um, I remember I broke a, a light fixture a couple of times because it was a glass one. And I'd be watching a football game and my team scored. I'd go, hooray, crack, and uh, busted it again. We moved out after a year ago. I mean, it was just too stressful to live in that place. For me, anyway, it was just difficult complicated both. That's why it's kind of more stress, because stress is like that. We feel pressure. A lot of things coming on there. Affliction, difficulty, tough times. What do you want to talk about? That's what he's talking about. You know, back in, uh, in 1967, two psychiatrists did uh, some interviews and wanted to find out if stressful events actually created physical illnesses, which they discovered it does. And we know it does, without a doubt. And, but they, they did it, and then something, their names were Holmes and Ray, and they developed what's called a Holmes and Ray stress scale. And by that, they identified numbers with certain types of stress. If you get over 300, you're definitely going to have physical issues. And they say, like, the death of a spouse is 100. Um, divorce is 73. Marital separation is 65. Marriage is 50. It's like, wow, there's a lot of stuff about marriage in this one. Um, death of a close family member, 63. Personal injury, illness, 53. Um, a child leaving home, 29. And a vacation is 13. So even that brings stress into your life, it seems like, which I think you can tell, you can say that that's very true. So if you have a certain number of these happening all at once, it builds up a tremendous stress into your life. 
I think about Job and what he went through within a half hour. I mean, he, he doubled and tripled over 300 probably. Um, um, and so they come. It doesn't make any difference what happens. Stress comes into life. And so it's there. We know it's there. But Paul challenges us through God's spirit how we're supposed to respond. He says we're to glory in tribulations. Now, interesting to note, the word glory is the same word as rejoice in verse 2. By then, we looked at that. He said, we're rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. So we look forward to the blessings of eternity. So it's part of our joy. We're excited about heaven and seeing Jesus. And he says, not only do we rejoice and excited and exalt in the truth of heaven, but we also rejoice and exalt and are excited about the stressful times of life. That's what he says. Kind of like James 1, count it all joy when you into various kinds of temptations or trials or difficulties and hardships. Not the kind of verses we like to read because typically our normal response to stressful situations and tough times is not joy, it's not happiness, it's not praise, it's not thanksgiving. It's complaining, it's murmuring, it's fussing, it's maybe getting frustrated, angry, discouraged. Maybe like Joshua, we blame God for it all anyway. We don't understand what's going on. We bring a lot of questions into our life. That's just how we are on a normal, regular basis. But, you know, the interesting thing is that these stressful times in our life reveal to us what's really going on spiritually inside of our life. We may think we're doing really, really well, and then we hit this kind of a bump in the road, and we begin to discover we're not as close to God as what we thought we were. Because tribulation has a tendency to bring up what's really inside of you. Way back in 2007, if you remember, a senior at Virginia Tech University, one of, one of those violent rampages, unfortunately, went into the emergency, I think it was the engineering section, he locked the doors so they could not get out, and they began to shooting, killed 32 people, wounded 17. One classroom he came into, the door was barred by a 76-year-old man named Levin Libruscu. He was a Romanian Jew who survived the Holocaust. He knew stressful times in his life. And when he heard what was going on, he told the students to escape out the windows. And his son got emails from students saying that Mr. Lebrescu actually put his life on the line for them to get them away. And he was one of those killed by that individual. So here is that moment of, of difficulty and hardship. He showed what was really inside of his heart, a heart of love and kindness for those around him. And so that's what stress does. That's what tribulation does. It, it unveils to us something about our lives. And Paul says, because of that, we rejoice in it. And there's reasons why we rejoice. He doesn't just simply say do it. He says, we know something. We rejoice knowing and the word knowing there means something we've learned in time past and we continue to learn all the way into the future. It's a personal, it's an experiential knowledge. We know, we really understand it. Well, what do we know? This is why we glory in tribulations. Not because we like things bad happen to us, but because we understand what these tribulations do for us. And he lists things. He says, tribulation, same word, affliction, stress, worketh patience. Now, worketh isn't included in verse 4 and verse 5 but it is implied, okay? So it's the same emphasis. Patience worketh experience, experience worketh hope. Um, the word works means to, um, to um, develop, to accomplish, to perform, to make something happen. And it's like a, always making something, it's a constant, constant activity being done. And the word patience is a word that uh, we get confused with because in our mindset, patience predominantly means being kind or being long-suffering with people. Usually that's what we typically think of the word patience. And that's long-suffering in the scriptures. This is the word that literally means to remain under something. It's only used in reference to situations and circumstances, never used with people. Um, it means the ability to stick to something no matter what happens. It means the ability to stand firm, to hold on to something. Um, that's why I, I, I would sit there and say that, that tribulation produces endurance in our life because endurance is a good idea of what it means like. Um, tribulation comes into our life, and what is it does? It enables us to stick closer to God than ever before. That's what it's supposed to do in our life anyway. But, but that's a process through which it works. It doesn't happen all at once. This is what our spiritual growth goes and how things work and how things grow. As we go through these difficult times, and God a lot of times allows us to go through things that aren't that really that complicated to us at the time they seem complicated, but as we grow on later on, it's not that complicated. I was telling the wife, I was doing some work in stress, I found out that uh, 
Uh, one graph I saw that, that ages uh, 20 to 35, 82% of them are very stressed or moderately stressed. But when you get to 65 and older, only 11% of them are stressed or moderately stressed. No, I don't know if this is real life or not, but it's like, as you get older, you begin to realize something. I know I realize the stuff that really stressed you out when you're younger doesn't bother you anymore because it's not that important to you. Stuff that stresses you out is a little different. You've learned, you've learned stuff. You've learned everything. You learn how to deal with things. And I deal with our grandchildren. We see it all the time. You know, I know when I was a father, I probably reacted totally completely different toward my grandchildren than what I do today because I've kind of met as a teenager. And so the struggles with that. And it's like I've told my daughter sometimes, you just have to ignore this part. Well, that's not hard to do. I say, well, I understand that, but I probably wouldn't ignore it when I was your age either, okay? But I've learned that's probably not a good thing to deal with right now because there's other things going to come down the road that are a lot more important than that. Um, and that's what we're talking about here, spiritually speaking. We get into something, God brings something in our life, we begin to realize that uh, God knows what he's doing. He loves us deeply. He's working to develop us and to become a more effective witness for him. And we understand that. As we understand it, begin to, to listen to his promises, his principles, to stand on those promises, begin to trust him, maybe a little bit here and there, but we begin to do it slowly but surely. But then as we continue on day after day, we go through some of these things. We see what he does, and the next time it comes along, we're, we're able to trust him a little bit more. And there's a process comes. So we begin to learn that as we go through this difficult time, that's not a time for me to abandon God. That's the time for me to really get close to God and stay close to God above all things. No, because that's what it does to me. It makes me stronger. I don't want to say the word tougher. It makes me stronger in the sense that I co tight to God because this is what I have to do. And sometimes that's the only one I can hold on to is God and his promises because outside of that, there is no hope whatsoever. It brings endurance into life. There was a missionary, Thomas Lambing, who was a medical missionary in Abyssinia. He said that uh, he saw the people many times in a native. They were across streams that had no bridges but very strong currents and uh, you know rocks, slippery rocks. And if they weren't careful, they could be slipping and carry down the stream into difficult situations and probably hit rocks and have complications. So he noticed what they would do is they would go find a big rock, the heavier the better, and they would lift it up and hold it up on their shoulders and then they begin to make the journey across. That extra weight kept them stronger, may help them have strong footing on their feet. So the weight, it, it helped the current not to push them aside, it actually gave them the ability to stay firmer all along the way. That's what these tribulations do to our lives, spiritually speaking. They're weights, but at the same time, as we respond to them correctly and trust God completely, they enable us to stay stronger upon God and stand a solid footing upon God and stand in His promises, and that enables us then to rejoice even in the midst of these things, because we know what God is doing and we trust Him. And that patience, that endurance, produces experience. Experience is an interesting word. I think it's a good translation. It's a word that was used in ancient times or in Greek times to describe an individual who had gone before a board and had taken a test and been approved to become a doctor of medicine. So it means like approved or someone who'd been tested and found to be okay. And that's why experience is okay. Is a good translation because experience is what we gain from doing things. We learn things. And sometimes, most of the time, we learn to do the right thing by doing the wrong things that don't work so well. And if you're going to have someone come work at your house or work on your car, you know, the goal would be to find someone who's experienced or surgery. You know, I mean, everyone has to start somewhere, but, you know, I'm thinking about being a little bit nervous to have someone go, oh, this is my first surgery. I'm excited about it. And you're going, uh, I don't know if I like that idea. I want to go with some guy who's done it for, you know, this is like thousands of times I've done this stuff, okay, so I know what I'm doing, it's okay, fine. Um, experience means a lot to people. And um, I like to use the word wisdom, too, because wisdom is experience put into reality. Wisdom is the ability to take knowledge and then put it to use. So as we go through life and go through these stressed times, it builds that strength and endurance in our life, and that gives us the experience and the wisdom to be able to know what steps to take and how to look at things differently so that we respond to them in a way that's different from the world responds to them. Because we're able to understand things they don't understand. We have God with us, we have his promises, we have his principles, and they give to us a different viewpoint of life that uh, some people don't fully understand. Although it doesn't happen sometimes. Sometimes we fail. I read a story about a, a dear man of God called Dr. Gordon. 
the, the D.A. Carson, I'm sorry. I think he wrote a couple books in the New Testament survey. And he and his friend were going to go to the beach for a nice, needed relaxation, just enjoy the day. And when he got there, he got quite disturbed because there's a whole bunch of uh, high school young people there. and They were anything but quiet, loud, loud music and, and you know, just difficult. So Mr. Carson was not happy. He even wrote about his thoughts. This is what he said. Deeply disappointed that my evening's relaxation was being shattered by a raucous party. I was getting ready to cover my disappointment by moral outrage. I turned to my friend Ken to unload upon him the venom that I had, but I stopped because I saw him staring at the scene with a faraway look in his eyes, and he said to me softly, high school kids, what a mission field. And Dr. Carson kind of humbled a little bit by that. Because he sat there and realized, I'm looking at a time that's in my, it's ruined my whole life. It's all messed up and horrible. I can't stand it. I'm angry and frustrated. And my friend looks at the same exact scene. What does he see? He sees people who need Christ. Experiences the same thing, but he came away with a whole different perspective of life. Um, because he just saw things a little differently. And sometimes that's what happens to us. As we go through these trials and tribulations, we begin to learn to trust God. We learn to pay attention to his promises, his principles. We begin to understand what he's doing, and that enables us now to make right choices, to do the right things, to see things from a different perspective, and that enables us then to be able to respond in a way of joy and hope and peace, even though everything seems to be falling around, part around us. And that wisdom brings eternal vision, hope. That understanding of what God is doing helps us to see things in light of eternity. Hope always means anticipating with absolute certainty what is yet to come. Now that means that, you know, when we go through, our, well, Paul puts it elsewhere, our light affliction on earth is really nothing compared with what the glories we have in heaven. Um, and, you know, we may sit there and say, well, I don't think my affliction is very light. But keep in mind, Paul is the one that wrote that. He was in prison, he was beaten, he was rejected, he was stoned. I mean, he faced things you and I have never faced in entire life. He looks at those things and says, that's just a light affliction. It means nothing compared to eternity. And that's one thing. We, it helps us see that reality. It helps us see that there's something ahead of us that's going to be different. That even as tough as it is today, there is coming a day when everything would be okay. Now, you know, I've said in time past, I wished that we could have someone, you know, send us a text from heaven or send us a... Uh, a picture from heaven, you know, like a, a selfie. And we could see the golden streets. We could see Jesus. We could see our loved ones, just like they do uh, when they're traveling somewhere, doing something different. But uh, that doesn't happen. We just have God's word and God's truth and what it means to us. But as we focus upon that new glorified body and that hope that we have in Christ, it reminds us again, you see, as we go through those afflictions, we go through, we keep our eye on the afflictions, we get depressed, we keep our eye on Christ and his hope, it changes everything for us. The unbeliever has no hope. They have nothing. They have no friend, they have no promise, they have no principles. They're empty, trying to go through life as best they can, but there's nothing that they're able to do in their life. But we have something totally different than what they have. We have God working in us and God working through us and even though we may not understand what's going on, God knows what he's doing, and we trust him. And we know that no matter what happens in life, there's going to come a time when I will go home, and getting home is the best thing that ever happened to me. And that's what reminds us of that. That's why we can rejoice, because we know that at the end, we're on the winning side, and we're going to be on the winning side. Jonathan Erickson Tata, I think most of you know who she is. Um, if I mention her name among the college students, I have to explain it because they have no idea who she is. Um, but she, of course, as a teenager, dove off the, some place and broke her neck and became a quadriplegic. Um, I think she's in her 70s now. And I can't imagine the stuff that she went through uh, in her early life to go through that. And that was years ago, back before they have all the technology they have today. Um, but she entrusted her life to Jesus Christ and accepted what God had done in her life. And, of course, God's blessed her abundantly. She's become an artist. She's become an author. I think she's even has done singing. And she has a ministry right now to many people who are handicapped and taking care of them. 
And, and she even got married. In fact, she'd been married for 25 years. In fact, I was thinking that uh, 46 years ago today was our, was our rehearsal dinner. Because tomorrow at 2 o'clock, 46 years ago, I said, I do. I kind of wonder why I did that, but I did it anyway. No, no. So uh, tomorrow's our anniversary, and we're celebrating by having surgeries. I don't know why we're doing that, but <laughs> better than doing VBS. We used to do VBS all the time during anniversaries. That's just the way it worked uh, most of the time. And, but she got married, been married, I think, for 25 years. Um, which is a tribute to her, her husband. And she tells in her story uh, that um, she was going to go down the center of the aisle in the church in a motorized wheelchair. And just as she got there, she looked around and she noticed that her wedding gown had gotten kind of caught in her wheelchair. It tore it, left a big grease stain on the whites. And then the flowers she had kind of slipped and fell down in her lap so they're not being held up. And of course, she can't do anything to fix them. And she's just standing and she was filled with disappointment, she said. And then the doors to the auditorium opened and she saw the face of her husband-to-be. And this is what she said, quote, Once I saw Ken's face, all I could think of was him. Everything else, the people in the church, the flowers that were sitting a little askew on my leg, the fact that my dress didn't fall right because I sat in a wheelchair, the grease marks, the rip in my gown, all of it paled in comparison. As I didn't care about anything. I just was cared about him. Well, that's the way it is in life. We keep our eyes upon Jesus Christ. Everything else just pales in comparison. It means nothing. And one day we're going to see him. One day we're going to be home. One day we're going to be able to be rejoicing in all that he has for us. And we keep our eyes on that. Everything we go through means it's like nothing because of what's ahead for us because of Jesus Christ. So we rejoice because these stressful times work endurance in our life, give us wisdom, give us eternal vision, and then that, that eternal vision, that hope, he says, does not make us ashamed because the love of God is spread in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Hope maketh not ashamed. That is, the word ashamed means to um, have uh, understand that disgrace is going to come from doing something and that disgrace then stops you from doing it. So you're thinking through something and as you think through, you said, if I do this and this happens, it's going to bring disgrace to my name or to my family. Therefore, I will not do it. I don't want to be ashamed. Well, he says, hope doesn't make ashamed. That is sometimes in his culture, in our culture, um, we can be put into a sense of disgrace by sharing the truth about Jesus Christ. There's an article that I kind of read a little bit that said the evangelical right is dying and America is going to go with it. And which means that the, you know, the, the people who follow God's principles are beginning to disappear, um, which is true, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, some of it is because there's a tendency in our culture that if you stand up for Christ and stand up for his truth, you are slammed heavily with negativism. I've told you before, there was a time that even though people didn't agree with you, they admired you for your principles, you stood for something. Not anymore. If you don't agree with the going on to the culture, you're an enemy. And when that kind of perspective pervades, you can see how particularly a younger generation, a younger Christian would be unwilling to share Christ because they don't want to be put in that category. They don't want to be shamed. They don't want to deal with that issue. And Paul says, well, of course, in his day, you can be arrested, you can be put to jail, you can be put to death. But he says, you know something? This hope we have in Christ makes us not to be ashamed. Instead, it motivates us to share the gospel all the more because the love of God is spread upon our heart. It's poured out all over the place. It permeates our life. We're overwhelmed with his love, and that motivates us to do all we can to live for him faithfully and to stand up for him to show the people that he has made a difference in our life. That's why we glory in tribulations, because we have something in our life that the world never has, and that something is the incredible love of God that never changes. It's not just the love of God that comes and gave his son. It's the love of God that's with us every step of the way. It's spread abroad our hearts, the Holy Spirit given to us. He spreads it about so we're able to respond to everything and anything with love in our life completely and totally. 
That's how life is supposed to be lived for him. We don't get, we glory in those tribulations because we know that God's with us, he cares for us, and that love that he has for us is even overwhelmed and, and made more sure and more certain because of what he's doing in our life. See, as we go through these tribulations, we learn, we understand, and the further we go in life and grow in Christ, begin to realize what I'm going through in life is not something that God's punished me. It's actually God's love shining on me to make me a better person for his honor, for his glory. That makes us love him all the more. And the more we love him, the more we serve him. The more we love him, the more we want to share the gospel. The more we love him, the more we sit there and stand up and we sit there, all that we can do for his honor, for his glory. Um, that's what tribulations do for us. Paul says, you know, we rejoice because in the end, it brings us back to the love of God and that changes everything in our life completely and totally. You know, there is a, a song in our book. Um, it's written by a lady who was in Sweden. Um, it was translated for us. Uh, I don't think we sing it here very much at all, but I, I know the song. And uh, the one who wrote it, her name was Carlina Berg. And she was a believer. Her father was a pastor. And she it was actually at a situation where um, her father and her were out on the boat and something happened, the boat capsized, and she saw her father drown right in front of her eyes and lost her father, which meant a lot to her. It was difficult for her to deal with that. But she learned, as Paul talked about, to trust in God and to allow those tough times to come. And so she wrote these words that share her testimony. This is what she says. Day by day and with each passing moment, Strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best, lovingly imparting pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me. He whose name is counselor and power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As your days, your strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation. So to trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose not face sweet consolation offered me within your holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take as from his Father's hand, one by one the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Day by day, that's a good way. But she said, you know, no matter what I face in life, I can glory in my tribulations because I know that they produce in my life a strength that only comes from him. It enables me to Trust him every more so I can begin to realize how life is and have the wisdom to make the right choices. And that reminds me of the realities of eternity and how that my life is blessed beyond measure. And all of that goes back to the very love of God and what he did for me and how he's with me every step of the way. And how he promises me what I go through in my life, he will be there with me and take me through safely all the way through. So those are good reasons to say, let's glory in our tribulation times. So when they come, and they're going to come, remember Romans 5, 3, 4, and 5, and ask God to help us respond with joy and praising God when these times come in our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings in our life. We thank you for all that you do for us. We don't like stressful, stressful times, Lord. We don't like what we have to go through. Uh, none of them are easy. None of them are fun. But yet we know in the word of God there are many good, solid reasons what you're doing in our life. Remind us, Lord, as we go through these tribulations that you're working in our life to help us become more effective for you everywhere we are. And may we just respond with joy and praise and thanksgiving, honestly, from our hearts and allow that attitude and that perception to be evident in our life so as to help those who don't know Christ see something different in us and respond and find the only God that can take care of them. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Amen.